News of the Times, Wicked Wednesdays, Stories of Sibling Murder. Welcome to News of the Times. Today we look at three cases dating between 1873 and 1875, where a sister is murdered by a fellow sibling. In all of these strange cases, the accused murderers never admitted their crime, even when they were caught in the act and seen to commit the crime. Our first case comes from County Derry in Ireland in 1873, where 80-year-old Nancy Martin has been murdered by her younger, 76-year-old sister with a pitchfork. Our second case from 1874 recounts the strange case of a 30-year-old brother murdering his 16-year-old sister. The reason given, jealousy, as she had a sweetheart he disapproved of. And our last case from Jersey in 1875 is especially interesting as the execution was a public one, despite public executions having been banned in England some seven years before. The murderer stood accused of shooting his sister in the face with an unsuccessful attempt to shoot his brother-in-law. Three cases between 1873 and 1875 where the murderer had killed their sibling is today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. We begin this episode with this case which caught our eye due to the unusual age of the murderer and victim. It would appear that the two sisters lived together quite poor and isolated. Comments are made about the dress being worn by the sisters as being some 50 years out of date. There was not much detail, but we are imagining the two huddled in their cottage day after day, year after year, possibly hating each other, until one of them breaks. From the Belfast Newsletter, the 6th of January, 1873, Dreadful Murder in County Derry. A shocking murder was committed on the night of Monday last, or early on the following morning, in the townland of Ballina Cross, situated between Maghira and Castle Dawson, and not far from the village of Nock Lofrim. The helpless victim of this fiendish murder is an old woman named Nancy Martin, who is over 80 years of age, and the perpetrator of the shocking deed is her sister, Mary Martin, but three or four years her junior. It was originally rumoured that this foul murder was committed with a hatchet, but it transpires that the instrument used is now shown to have been a pitchfork. This implement has been taken charge of by the constabulary, and it has been found to correspond with the wounds upon the head and face of the murdered woman. An inquest was held on Wednesday by D. Kelly Esquire, coroner for the district, and after a careful investigation of the circumstances of the case, the jury found a verdict of willful murder against the accused, Mary Martin. The prisoner was taken in charge by the constabulary at Gulladoof Station, in which place she was lodged on Wednesday night. The prisoner, Mary Martin, is an old woman, whose appearance at first glance would lead one to imagine that she was fast verging on her 90th birthday from the careworn, haggard appearance her gypsy-like features presented. She is a woman of the ordinary size, dressed with a dirty Muslim cap, with paralleled rows of lace borders. She was closely wrapped in a long black cloak that might have been the fashion half a century ago. The prisoner was closely guarded by sub-constables McGee and Lindsay while passing through the town, and at every corner along the street crowds greeted her with groans and hisses. The prisoner 
who is said to be 76 years of age, arrived in Derry on Friday night under committal by the coroner's warrant, in which she is charged with having caused the death of Nancy Martin by inflicting several wounds and injuries on her head, face and arms on the night of the 30th of December or early on the following morning. Mary is placed in prison where she has needed to be placed in restraints. It is hard to say from the sketchy police new and newspaper reports, but quite possibly she was suffering from dementia. We do not have recordings of her having confessed or even to understand her crime. From the Londonderry Sentinel, the 20th of March, 1873, charge of murder. Mary Martin, who is charged with the murder of Nancy Martin, her sister, at Ballina Cross, near Magira, on the 31st of December, was then put forward. The old woman, on coming into the dock, seemed to be incapable of understanding her position, and the issue was put to the jury to try whether she was of sound mind and capable of pleading to the indictment. Dr. William Miller, surgeon to Londonderry Jail, was examined and stated his conviction that the prisoner was incapable of pleading. He had had to put her under restraint while in the jail. The jury found that the prisoner was not of sound mind and incapable of pleading the indictment. His lordship said, The direction of the court is that the finding recorded and that Mary Martin be kept in strict custody in the jail of Londonderry until Her Majesty's pleasure shall known. We do not know what happened to Mary. There are no further reports that we have access to telling us what really happened to her. Case 2. Our second case takes place near Ripon. William Jackson, 30 years of age, by all accounts, spends much of his time drunk. He lives in the house with his parents and sister, who, upon his return from yet another drunken reverie, is booted out of the house by his father. It would appear that William and Elizabeth had a close relationship, and, concerned for her brother's welfare, she goes in search of him. He is the last person known to have seen her alive. From the Newark Herald, the 6th of June, 1874, the murder by a brother in Yorkshire. William Jackson, charged with the murder of sister Elizabeth Jackson, 16, of at Kirklington near Ripon, early in May, was brought up for examination before the Wath magistrate at Northallerton Jail. For some days after the murder, the prisoner was missing, but eventually he was traced into the county of Durham and finally captured after being chased around the colliery yard at West Auckland. On the 18th, he was taken from Northallerton Jail to Wath Police Station, where the charge was to be gone into. While in there, where he had been put pending the opening of the court, he made a desperate attempt to commit suicide, inflicting a severe gash in his throat by means of a piece of tin. Injuries, though not likely to prove fatal, were such as to postpone the examination, and he was again remanded and subsequently taken back to North Allerton. Mr Dale, solicitor of York, now appeared to prosecute on behalf of the North Riding Chief Constable, and about 18 witnesses were called in the course of the hearing. The list included the father and mother of the deceased girl, who spoke as to the prisoner threatening them on the night before he left Carthorpe. He had come home drunk, and the father told him to be off. The prisoner said that before he did, there would be bloodshed. No one actually sees William kill his sister, but yet there is considerable testimony, including from his own parents, as well as circumstantial evidence that convinces the jury. From the Paisley Herald and Renfrewshire Advertiser, 8th of August 1874, trial for murder, sentence to death. 
At the York Assizes on Friday, the trial of William Jackson, aged 29, an army reserve man for the murder of his sister, a young girl 16 years of age, at Kirklington on the 15th of May last, was proceeded with. The deceased Elizabeth Jackson and her brother, the prisoner, lived together at their parents, the father being a respectable well-to-do labourer at Carthorpe, a secluded village near Ripon. On the evening of the 14th of May last, the prisoner went home drunk, a not unusual state for him to be in, and was told by his father that he could do with him no longer. A quarrel ensued in which the prisoner threw a stool at his father and used threatening language. The next day the prisoner left home, and in the afternoon he seems to have met his sister, the deceased, and they were together at a shoemaker's in the adjoining village of Kirklington. They left there apparently on the best of terms, as usual, with each other. Subsequently, in a field leading to the hamlet of Thornborough, the two were seen together. The girl seemed to be in distress, and the prisoner talking to her. Next morning, her dead body was found in the field, her throat being cut in a frightful manner from ear to ear. The prisoner was missing for some days, and after wandering northwards, making curious statements to certain persons whom he met, was apprehended at Bishop Auckland. Afterwards, when in the police cell in Wath Station waiting to be examined, he made an unsuccessful attempt upon his life by cutting his throat with a piece of sharpened tin. The evidence was all of a circumstantial character, and in its course it was elicited that the deceased was at the time of the murder engaged to a young man named Edward Gatenby, and to that engagement the prisoner had expressed his opposition. The prisoner said she should never have him, a handsome girl like her. At the conclusion of the evidence, the judge summed up, and the jury found the prisoner guilty of willful murder. Sentence of death was then pronounced. William is executed in York, protesting his innocence to the last. Case 3. Our last case takes place in Jersey in 1875. Jersey is a British Crown dependency, but is actually located closer to the northwest of France. England had abolished public executions in 1868. However, Jersey had not changed their own statutes legally to follow suit, and seemed utterly taken aback when this rare and unusual case took place. The weapon of choice was a rifle filled with shot. The shot sprays out at high velocity and causes an unbelievable amount of damage. Background Nancy and Joseph Lebrun are brother and sister. Nancy is married to Philip Lawrence. The accused, Joseph Lebrun, lives very near to the old, small, fashioned cottage of his sister Nancy and her husband Philip. Philip and Joseph actually work together, and Joseph, being single, often comes over to his sister's, Nancy's house, for dinner. Nancy and Joseph, as brother and sister, are known to have a good relation. Joseph and Philip were known to have had a mild disagreement a few weeks prior, but the disagreement did not seem to be lasting. Philip had just received the huge sum of £25, worth approximately £3,600 in 2024. He has handed this money to his wife, Nancy, in the presence of Joseph. Nancy locks the money away. Within the house, they also have a loaded rifle, which is easily accessible. Again, Joseph, who knows their house well, has borrowed the gun from time to time, so knows the location, where the shot is located and how the rifle works. The day before the murder, he's heard to tell a friend that he has something that he needs to do and also that he has plans to travel. 
From the Star, the 19th of December, 1874. Dreadful murder of a woman. Attempted murder of her husband. Arrest of the deceased brother on suspicion. Yesterday morning, our island was startled by the announcement of the commission of a crime which happily is of rare occurrence here, that of murder. It is now nearly nine years since a similar offence was committed on this island. That crime, startling as it was, has been surpassed in atrocity in the present instance, both by the fact that an attempt at a double murder has been made and that there is reason to believe the crime has been committed by the brother of the victim whose life has thus been suddenly taken. The location of the crime was the parish of St. Lawrence and the immediate scene of the dreadful tragedy was the dwelling house of Philip Lawrence and his wife. It may be described as a small farmstead, Lawrence occupying a bit of land and cultivating it with his wife. His brother-in-law, Joseph Lebrun, his wife's brother, occasionally helping him. The dwelling house is a low, two-storied building with rooms on each side of the entrance, there being a wide passage which leads to the stairs by which the upper rooms are reached. On the right-hand side of the passage, on entering, is the kitchen in which the dreadful tragedy we have to detail was committed. A jury was impanelled yesterday afternoon by the Deputy Viscount in the presence of the Attorney General. An inquiry was opened, particulars of the evidence tendered being given below. The jury, having been sworn, proceeded to inspect the body of the deceased Nancy Lebrun, wife of Philip Lawrence. The kitchen in which it was found is one of the old-fashioned kind, with an earthen floor, the ceiling being low, and opposite the door is a fireplace, and alongside of this is a large open space, similar to the old-fashioned country fireplace, in which is the oven. On the right-hand side of the room, against the front wall, was an old sofa covered with canvas or other coarse material, and in the middle of the room a table, on which was a bundle, of which mention is made in the evidence. On the floor near the table was a quantity of blood, and on the sofa was the deceased woman, who was about fifty years of age, and she was lying with her head reclining on the right shoulder, of the sofa. Her face presented a frightful spectacle, being punctured all over with shot holes, the left side more especially, which appeared to have received the larger portion of the charge of a gun. A piece of the nose was carried away, and the left cheekbone was broken by the shot. On the sofa at her right hand was a large quantity of blood, of which there was a quantity on the floor close to the sofa. In front of this also was a bucket or large kit in which the deceased's feet were found when the discovery of the murder was made. Search being made, several shots were picked up. Some were found in the woodwork of one of the windows nearly in line with the position of the deceased's head as it was supposed to have been when she received the fatal wound. Some shots were also found in a cupboard door close to the window and some on the floor on which they appear to have fallen after striking the door or the window. Hanging in front of the large open fireplace was an old curtain such as is commonly used for acting as a preventative to the smoke coming out of the chimney. An examination of this showed that at one end, the furthest from the front of the house, a full charge of shot had passed and lodged in the wall of the chimney, having travelled in an oblique direction. All this went to lead to the conviction that two shots had been fired in the room, in addition to that which had been fired at Lawrence himself, as detailed in his evidence. All that has been discovered as yet leads to the theory that the murderer, whoever he be, 
had fired one shot at his victim from the door of the room in an oblique direction, the shot missing her and taking effect in the chimney corner mentioned, and that the second had been fired also from the door while she sat on the sofa. Having accomplished this terrible deed, it is presumed that he covered the deceased's face with a shawl and calmly waited at the entrance for the husband and fired at him as detailed in his evidence. After making as minute an examination as possible in the circumstances, the jury repaired to the residence of Mr John Lawrence about 300 yards from the scene of the dreadful tragedy whether the husband of the deceased had been taken. He lay on the temporary bed in a large room and the inquiry was opened in his presence. The first witness called was Centenia Hammond, who deposed as follows. Last evening at about nine o'clock, I was informed by George Lawrence, constable's officer, that Philip Lawrence had been killed and that suspicion pointed to his brother-in-law. Joseph Lebrun, as the murderer. I came to this house occupied by Mr John Lawrence, where the mother of the wounded man resides. I saw Philip Lawrence and asked him who had done him the injury, and he replied that it was Joseph Lebrun, his brother-in-law. He was in so weak a state that I could not press him for further information. He was quite sensible and knew well what he was saying. Mr. George Lawrence informed me that yesterday afternoon he saw Joseph Lebrun, who said to him, I have a deed to do this evening. I then resolved to have him apprehended and proceeded with George Lawrence, Clement Rondell and George Lawrence to the house of the accused. On the way we went to the house of Mr. Lawrence, the wounded man, where the murder had been committed, we saw the door open and went into the house. We went in to see what we could. There had been nothing said up to that time about Mrs. Lawrence being dead, nor had we any suspicion that a murder had been committed. Her husband apparently did not know anything about it, for he never mentioned a word about her. I saw the gun, a single barrel, lying in the passage, the muzzle resting on the skirting board. On entering the room, we found Mrs. Lawrence the deceased, sitting on the sofa in the middle of it, her back resting against the back of the sofa, her arms stretched, and her head was lying a little on the left and towards the door of the room. Her face was covered with a shawl, which also covered part of her body. She was fully dressed and had on her shoes and stockings. In front of the sofa was an empty bucket in which her feet were resting or hanging. On taking off the shawl, we found that she had been shot, her face being riddled with shot and covered with blood. She was quite dead. There was a large quantity of blood on the sofa and also blood on the floor in two places, and a bundle that was on the table was bespattered with blood. After this discovery, we locked up the house and returned here, where we found that doctors Crozier and Godfrey had arrived and were attending to the wounded man. This was about eleven o'clock. As I wished to remain beside Mr. Lawrence, the husband, I sent Mr. Charles Rondell and Mr. George Lawrence to arrest the prisoner, which they did, finding him in bed. He lives in a room of a house at Le Vin de Gros, not far from the residence of the deceased. He was in the habit of working with his brother-in-law and got most of his meals with him. After the prisoner was arrested, he was conveyed to town, to the police station, and was afterwards put in jail. Philip Lawrence, the wounded man, has since told me that he received his wounds by a gun being fired at him as he opened the front door to enter his house last night, and that it was the prisoner, Joseph Lebrun, who had fired at him. Philip, dreadfully wounded from being shot in the face, recovers. He is quite clear 
that it was his brother-in-law who shot him. From the Jersey Independent and Daily Telegraph, 12th of January, 1875, and also the Jersey Independent on Tuesday morning, January the 18th, 1875. After some little delay, the adjournment inquest was resumed on Monday. The only witness called was Philip Lawrence, who appeared in court with his jaw bandaged and his head enveloped in a shawl. In answer to the Attorney General, he deposed that he left the house at about three o'clock, and his brother-in-law, Le Brun, was there. Philip had dined with him. He visited several places in the town, and at about 6.30, when he left the town, he went through Charing Cross, and then went to St John's with another man who left him there. While he was in the town, he had had about two glasses of rum and a glass of ginger beer, and afterwards he then went, left Horton and went straight to his house, meeting no one on the road. He continued, My house is about three miles from the town, and when I got home I noticed there was a light in the door. I didn't knock, I opened the top door, and the shot was fired. I didn't at first feel the least pain. I took hold of my whiskers and I saw the flash of the gun. The shot came from the direction of the kitchen. Then I called out. I think there was only one shot. I entered into the kitchen after it was fired. I saw my brother-in-law near the fireplace. He had his back turned to me, but I'm sure it was he. He had the same clothes on as when I had left him. He had his hat on. I said, what have you done? You've shot me. He made no answer. I didn't jump at him to arrest him. I found I was all covered with blood, and I ran to get away. There was a little lamp lighted in the room, and I, I didn't see the gun. I don't know if he had it in his hand. I didn't notice if my wife was in the room, and I couldn't say if he was there. I called out when I ran away. Mr. Clement Rondell came to my help, and I left my bundle on the table. I do not know if my brother-in-law came in after me. He did not call after me. We had never had any quarrel. About two months before, I had had a few words with him, but my wife never quarrelled with me. I did not hear anyone talking before I went in. I was not frightened by the pain of the wound, but by seeing the blood. I did not say what time I should go home. Lebrun always took tea with us. There were no tea things on the table when I came in. We generally had tea at about five o'clock. He usually left our house at about 8.30 p.m. The gun was generally kept in a corner in the kitchen. The shot and powder were kept in a cupboard there. It was not locked, and Lebrun knew where it was. Seeing the gun produced, he said, That's mine, the one that was kept in the house. It was loaded as I had been shooting on Monday morning, but I did not fire it off. I loaded it with mixed shot. The shot pouch had powder flask and were left in the house. I don't know what kind of paper I used for the wad. I left the gun on the left-hand corner of the door, and I didn't take off the cap when I put the gun down. Philip Lawrence continued, My wife was in the habit of wearing a shawl over her shoulders or head. I had received some money, about £25, pounds a few days before and gave it to my wife. I had it on Sunday morning and I don't know what she did with it. I never saw it after I gave it to her. Lebrun knew that she had had it because he was there when I gave it to her. She generally kept the money in the drawers or upstairs. The money was put in a cupboard upstairs which was locked and the key was put in a drawer. The money I couldn't find when I looked there recently. My wife would certainly have told me if she had spent that sum. She had never done such a thing. The money was kept inside the cupboard and a little box about six inches square. I kept a dog. It knew Lebrun well, and it was a small dog and often went with Lebrun. It is with me now. The dog was in the kitchen when I went in, 
It would have barked at any stranger coming. The dog followed me directly I ran out of that, that night. Lebrun generally went through the garden to his house. I am positive that it was my brother-in-law in the house and that it was he who fired at me. I have not the slightest doubt in my mind. That was the whole of the evidence, and the jury, after consulting privately for a quarter of an hour, returned a verdict of willful murder against Joseph Lebrun. Lebrun utterly refutes that he killed his sister and tried to kill his brother-in-law. The twenty-five pounds is missing from the house, but also cannot be found in Joseph's house. It's just vanished. However, Philip is absolutely certain that it was his own brother-in-law who had attempted to kill him, and who, with his location in the house, most likely killed Nancy. Lebrun is unable to come up with any kind of real alibi. With the very demeaning evidence of eyewitness testimony given in court, Joseph is found guilty. From the Star, the 10th of July, 1875, the St. Lawrence tragedy sentence passed. Today the court was more crowded than on Wednesday, and at ten o'clock the jurors, who had passed the night in the Imperial Hotel, entered. The trial commenced at ten-thirty. The prisoner, Joseph Philip Lebron, having pl been placed at the bar charged with the murder of his sister, Nancy Lawrence, also with endangering the life of Philip Lawrence, his brother-in-law, on the 15th of December last. The bailiff summed up the case briefly, dwelling on the various points of importance and directing the jury to do their duty. He expressed himself as having the greatest confidence in the jury. The jury returned the expected verdict of guilty and the legal sentence of death is passed. The Home Office in England is contacted. There is no reprieve for Lebrun. However, the thorny issue as to whether the execution will be public or private, as is now the case in England, became the main topic within the papers. From the Star, the 3rd of August, 1875, the convict Lebrun. We are assured that in the event of the unfortunate Lebrun undergoing the penalty to which he has been condemned, the execution will take place publicly. We hope the execution will be a private one, as is the case in England, and a representation made to this effect to the bailiff might induce him and other members of the prison to reconsider the decision they have taken and thus spare the island the disgusting spectacle of a public execution. No official intelligence is to hand respecting the fate of the wretched man, although various reports are afloat with reference to the ultimate decision of the Home Secretary. One thing that is certain, and that is that should the execution take place, it will be a public one. The prison board has no power to order a private execution in so much as it would be necessary to hold an inquest on the body to prove the cause. The decision is made to proceed with the public execution, and the scaffold is built outside the prison. The scene is reported as very crowded, but no estimates of numbers were given. Marwood is brought in to do the execution. To the last, Lebrun protests his innocence. From the Star, the 14th of August, 1875, the execution of Joseph Lebron for the murder of his sister. Respecting the conduct of the murderer, it may be said that yesterday he was visited by his brother-in-law, Lawrence, at his own request. The two men conversed very briefly together. Lawrence said he had not come to argue the point with him. Lebrun wished to speak at length of his innocence but the interview was cut short by his visitor, who, however, pardoned him in shaking hands. Marwood placed his victim on the iron and quickly bound his legs with the strips, adjusting the white covering over his face, and everything 
was then ready. The excitement of all around now became tense. Down in the crowd below the scaffold, two or three women swooned away, and one rent the air with hysterical shrieks. His last words were, Lord Jesus, save my soul, and immediately afterwards, the clergyman, having retired after shaking hands with him, Marwood quickly drew the bolt, and Lebrun was ushered into eternity. There he hung to the gaze of the spectators from without. Lebrun, we are told, continued to assert his innocence to the last to his spiritual advisers, saying he could not confess what he had not done. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, Stories of Sibling Murder. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful where we look at crimes in a location such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. If you like this channel, you may be interested in our sister channel, Chronicle of the Times, where we offer a lighter side of Victorian and Edwardian news stories, as well as a weekly podcast of stories from authors of the day, such as Dickens, Collins, Benson and Conan Doyle. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>